Good afternoon folks, welcome back to Advanced Higher Chemistry. We're going to tackle uh, hybrid and molecular orbitals today. Hybridization, actually, it should be. Um, and molecular orbitals. <sighs> now what's going on here? It's it's SQA, pages 78 to 81. It doesn't look that big, but there's some big concepts in here. So uh, it's not like me, I know, but I thought I'd plan in advance and try and split this into four sort of areas. Number one. A very brief revisit of atomic orbitals and covalent bonds. Super brief. Number two, why uh, atomic orbitals have to be scrapped when it comes to any molecule whatsoever. So all those nice SPD orbitals and stuff apply to isolated atoms in a vacuum. Not the real world. Um, so there are two reasons we have to scrap atomic orbitals when it comes to building molecules. Like, for example, the carbon dioxide I'm breathing out just now. And we'll come back to what they are. Number three, how molecular orbitals actually form and overlap with each other, and why the 1960s representation of a double bond, which showed it with a line and then a dotted line, is actually superior to the modern representation. Because we're about to see that these two bonds are most definitely not identical to each other. And lastly, on the subject of molecular orbitals, we'll have a look at how they managed to create all these wonderful pigments. Uh, in the real world, the wonderful blues and the orange of these pens are a result of molecular orbitals interacting with light. So I think what we'll do first is, as I promised, we'll have a brief recap of atomic orbitals. It is props day today. I've got many, many props here today. These are uh, representations of S orbitals, these nice little pink blobs. Uh, and as you can see, they are spherical, like we learned before. P orbitals, on the other hand, more of these hourglass figures, one in, let's call that the y direction, one in the x direction, and of course one sticking up into the camera in the z dimension. So, yeah, s orbitals, p orbitals, yeah, everything's fine, everything's fine. Um, a brief mention of, uh, if you're not sure about these by the way, go back and have a look at some of my earlier videos. Um, a brief mention on covalent bonds. A covalent bond is defined as when two half-filled orbitals overlap with each other. Now, in previous years, uh, we showed them, <laughs> back when life was simple, we showed it as that, for example, for H2. Uh, and that is surprisingly accurate, of course. If we had two of these, we could simply mash them into each other, and they would overlap and form a region of space containing two electrons, uh, that is a full single orbital, uh, a covalent bond, in other words, effectively. Um, where am I going with this? Yeah, I'd like to have a look at why we need to scrap this representation of atomic orbitals. If, for example, we looked at one of our favourite elements, carbon. Carbon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Now, of course, that means that there are in the p electron, p orbitals, I apologise, there are three p orbitals, px, py, pz, and there are two electrons. Now, there's a couple of problems here, because if we assume that we were going to bring in some electrons from another atom, say, oh, hydrogen, uh, and share these orbitals, then you would only ever get carbon and hydrogen and that. I suppose if you had a data bond, maybe, you could bring in something else, you know, uh, and do that. But even that uh, does not explain the shape. Because these are three orbitals in space. And if we analyse methane molecules, we get our normal tetrahedron. Now, there's obviously four involved there, just in case you haven't been paying attention. So, this is, by the way, this is empirically derived. This is absolutely the truth. Because if you freeze uh, methane and shine x-rays through it, there's something called x-ray diffraction. It used to be in the course, taken out. Taken out? Sorry, taken out. Um, you truly do get this. And we use the VSEPR, valence shell electron repair repulsion theory, and we find that the bond angle um, is 109.5 degrees for a pure tetrahedron. Um in between all of these hydrogens. So this is absolutely true, and, but it doesn't fit with this. So 
there's two things going on here. Number one, the orbital, the box notation doesn't seem to tie up with what you actually find. And number two, even if this was true somehow, this would be just three. A hydrogen's able to attach, not four. So what's going on? Those are the two reasons uh, that we need to develop the theory of molecular orbitals. Just before we leave molecules behind, by the way, before we're done today, I'm hoping you will understand why this is the tetrahedron shape. Everybody just accepts it. Why is it not flat, for example? Why is it in three dimensions? And of course, when you build, the moly mods are so good because when you build this ethene molecule, you can see it is planar. It's totally flat. These hydrogens are in the same plane as these ones. And that's also what you find. And although we don't talk about these much, these are the alkynes. So this is a triple bond called ethyne. And this is a linear molecule. The two hydrogens are directly in line with each other. Um... And again, we'll have a look at why that happens. Excuse me, just let me tidy up my props a bit. So let's have a look at how atomic orbitals can hybridize with each other. Sounds a bit dodgy. Um, to form molecular orbitals. Uh, if we had, for example, in the case of, let's stick with carbon, because we know we've got to be making four bonds. Okay, we know that, that's for sure. Um, so how is that, how could that become possible? Now, if we look at our two Ps again, we have three 2p orbitals, and we also had a 2s orbital. So this was our 2s, these were our 2ps, and in this, in these orbitals, we had one, two, three, four electrons. Effectively what we used to call the four electrons in the second layer. <laughs> Remember that when life was, was easy? Um, so what happens is we are fairly confident that these Orbit orbitals, these orbitals will hybridize with each other and you will end up joining this orbital with this orbital and we will make this. So we now have four orbitals and there are four electrons to be distributed in amongst them. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, and of course that explains nicely why the methane you know, we'll have four things attached to the carbon because now we've got four little hybrid orbitals. Excellent. Um, what do we call these hybrid orbitals? This is not helping because the naming system is, to say the least, a little bit confusing. Now, we had an S orbital, a single S orbital, and we hybridized it with three P orbitals. So these are called SP3. And I've chosen to put the three there, which is sort of where you would... Like previously, we would have said, like you know, 2s2, 2p2. Now, in all the other forms of notation, irritatingly, that's the number of electrons that are in this particular orbital. That is not true here. Uh, all it's telling us is that there is 1s and 3p's hybridized together. Now, if you do that, you end up uh, with four orbitals in space that are of equal energy, so they degenerate. Each one contains one electron. So what you can do, of course, is you can bring a neighboring hydrogen atom in. The hydrogen atom can donate one of its, it's one electron, sorry, into that. And we can start making, oh yeah, look, we make methane. Um, let's, uh, let me gather my thoughts for a second. Yeah, let's talk briefly about how these orbitals overlap. Um, so we have four sp3 orbitals, as I said on here, um, and they can overlap end on with incoming atoms. So we could join a hydrogen to this, or of course, I suppose, we could join another carbon to it. Um, excuse me, sorry about that. Good audio background sounds, sorry about that guys. So we could join another carbon to it and then we can rinse and repeat. You know, we could have other, other sp3s coming out, four other sp3s coming out of here, and we can just form what you would call normal single carbon-carbon bonds. So, how's this done? This is done by an end-on overlap, pay no attention to the rest of this molecule, an end-on overlap from sp3 orbitals. This has got one electron, this has got one electron, boom. You create a normal, whatever that means, single bond. So, let's put that in text form for a second. So, yeah, in normal single bonds, so where you could have CC or CH or C, whatever you like, one of the halogens, uh, these are formed by end-on overlap between orbitals. Each orbital uh, contributes an electron, 
um, to form the bond. Um, and you're probably saying, well, what else is the option? Of course that's what happens. Yeah, uh, that is true for single bonds. And I was hinting that there might be other ways that they could hybridize with each other. And that's just what we're coming back to next. But before we do that, we've got a term for this sort of normal single carbon-carbon bond. It is called a sigma bond, given that symbol there. So a sigma bond is caused by end-on overlap of half-filled orbitals forming a covalent bond. Grant, so what are the other options then? Well, if I can find my orange pen, I'll stick with the same colour code as I had last time. Uh, last time I had 1s, sorry, 2s, I apologise, and 2p orbitals. Uh, so that's my 2s, that's my 2p, and in blue I had the electrons, and we had 1, 2 electrons in there, and 1, 2 electrons here. And we just smudged them all together to make 4. Now, what if all of them didn't want to join this hybrid party? What if one of these p orbitals did not join the party and stayed by itself? We would hybridize this lot here together. So let's do that. And you would have a standalone 2p. So this is still 2p, nothing's changed there. We still have four electrons, so let's spread the four electrons out like that. Now, last time, when we smashed them all together, there were three p's and an s, so we called it sp3. This time, um, we have got uh, an s, but we only used two of the p orbitals so these are called sp2 hybridized orbitals, and this just remains a p by itself. Prop time. Now this guy here is a model of both of these at the same place in space. The grey ones are the sp2 hybrid orbitals, and these guys here are the unhybridized p orbital. In this case, the one in the z-dimension. Now, what's going on here? Well, with the three grey ones, we can still do standard, simple, end-on overlap. So we could, for example, we could overlap a hydrogen here. We could overlap another hydrogen here without the irritating poppy noises. And we could, for example, we could overlap a carbon onto the third grey one. So we are starting to build up a molecule here. I'm hoping this molecule might be looking vaguely familiar because I threw it at you at the start of the video. It's the start of an ethene molecule. There's the carbon, there's the two hydrogens, and here's the other carbon here. Now, the bonding in the middle. I said the 1960s version of this representation showed a very big difference between these two bonds, and that is correct. Because what's going to happen here is best shown in diagrammatic form. And I've got one that's just fallen off my desk. Excuse me. Here we have the scholar diagram of what's going on. So this is their drawing of... This is their drawing of my model here. Um, where this is a hybrid orbital. So are these two. And this is the unhybridized p orbital. Um, and they're trying to show you what happens here when two of these guys come together. You get the standard end-on overlap. Um, and what does this p orbital do? Well, please remember that there is one electron in this p orbital. Remember that? That single electron. The problem here, conceptually, is that that electron can be anywhere within this whole p orbital. There's one electron shared in the whole thing. So there's one electron here, somewhere. This used to be easier when we did hybrid, uh, Heisenberg's principle. And there is also one electron in here. And there was one electron, technically speaking, there was one electron in all of these, and one in the whole thing here. So we can still form four bonds, 
It's just that one of the bonds is going to be a really weird one. Um, you've probably skipped ahead and looked at this in the diagram, but what's going on here is the two unhybridized p orbitals have decided to smudge sideways into each other. So this whole thing here is your second bond. This is your first bond, and the whole thing here is the second bond. So that is the true nature behind, as we draw it, that. So one of these bonds is a standard end-on overlap, and the other bond is a sideways overlap. So one of these bonds, if you remember correctly, we called it a sigma bond. Uh, and one of these, the other bond, is the different type. Now you're probably looking at this, it's a pi bond, absolutely. So what is a pi bond? A pi bond is sideways overlap of two unhybridized p orbitals, each of which contain one electron, which means, of course, that in this green smudge here, there's going to be a total of just two electrons in the whole thing. That's why, although it looks almost like a triple bond, it's really not, because there's two electrons in here, and there's two in this whole smudge here. So that is a double, that's the truth behind the double bond. Might explain a few things. It certainly explains why it's it being the ethene is planar. Remember I said it was totally flat? Because if you look at the hits, the sp2 hybridization is totally flat. And the unhybridized p orbital here sticks up and above, uh, up and down above this structure here. If you have done, or if depending on the order it's taught, you may have heard of a molecule called benzene, which is a hexagonal system of six carbons, each of which apparently only has um, three bonds between them. That's not quite true, because uh, what they are actually is all sp2 hybridized. A benzene ring is a complete sp2 hybridization ring, and the fourth electron, each of these little p orbitals that stick up and below the page, I'm not going to try and show this in two dimensions, but they all smudge into each other. So there is a delocalized fourth electron in all these p orbitals. They actually form a hybrid that goes around the entire ring. That's why we represent benzene with the circle there, because there truly is a single pi bond that goes around the entire structure. It's just one of the reasons that makes benzene special, and that's why it crops up all over the place in nature. It's incredibly stable. And that's why it's totally flat as well, by the way. If you do benzene later on, or if you've done it already, you'll know that benzene is a planar molecule because it is sp2 hybridized. How's this going? Is this making sense so far? Uh, we need to write this down, don't we? Because we said on our last sheet, we said that a, a sigma bond was an end-on overlap. Oh, if I can find the last sheet, there we go. Unprofessional, hey, there we go. So a sigma bond was uh, caused by end-on overlap. So let's do a pi bond then. Let's add a pi bond to this. So a pi bond, um, that would be, there's no point in watch, make, I'm not going to make you watch me write this out. So the SQ quotes it as side on. I don't know what that phrase means, side on. Sideways overlap of two half-filled p orbitals forming a covalent bond, of course, because a covalent bond was a shared pair of electrons in space. Um, it's just that if you look at the actual structure of it, it looks really weird. I've got a nice diagram here from Tinternet of the same idea. So here are the sp2 orbitals, and that's them overlapping there. That's your sigma bond in orange there. Here just for clarity, are the p orbitals sideways overlapping just by themselves, and they've reverted the sigma bonds. By the way, can I remind you, these are all sigma bonds. Um, and a single pi bond amongst it. And this is the whole shebang. This is everything all uh, on top of each other. And that's the true nature of ethene. That, of course, is why it's so reactive. That's why you can take ethene and react it with bromine all the way back in third year. Uh, and then magically this bond breaks and you stick a bromine on there and a bromine on there and now they're all sigma bonds we got rid of the pi bonds because pi bonds are easier to break than sigma bonds by a long way that's why you can't simply do the same reaction again and just break the other one because the other one is very different to the first one I think I've covered sp2 hybridization there 
And if you pick up the tone of my voice, I'm about to say there might be one last option. So the very first time around, we took the 2S and all three Ps, and we formed SP3, four of them. Last time, we formed SP2s, only three of them this time, and this remained unhybridized. You can probably work it out yourself what the last option is. Let's squeeze it in here. So the last option now is we go back to where we started with carbon. Pops, uh, pop our four electrons in the second layer. And this time we're going to take the S and just one of the P's. So these are called SP1 hybrid orbitals. And this time we've got two of the P's which don't want to join this party. This is a 2P. Call it 2PX, just for easy counting. And this one is 2PY. Basically, you know, a different dimension. 90 degrees to it, actually, isn't it? Um, and we have to fill in our four electrons again. Please remember, there are we're not pulling electrons out of a hat here. So, one, two, three, and four. Now, prop time again. What we've got here... This is meant to represent what happens when you have sp1 hybridization. Uh, this is not asked about a lot or mentioned about a lot, but it is specifically said in the SQ outcomes, so that means you know what they're like, they can ask you about it if they feel that way. Um, we have got two orbitals, identical energy orbitals, that are trying to get as far away from each other as possible, so they are at 180 degrees, and we've got a px, say, for example, and a py unhybridized. Now, how on earth do these overlap? These overlap to form the alkynes with a triple bond. And this was my alkyne model, and I'm hoping you can perhaps see that represents a sigma bond here, and there's another sigma bond here. Let me get a diagram. Let me get a diagram that's the right way up. Now, what on earth is going on here? In black, we have the sp1 hybrid orbitals. So one sticks backwards, one sticks forwards, just like this. One overlaps with a hydrogen, and the other one overlaps with another sp1 hybrid on here. I'm sorry, I don't have another sp1 hybrid molecule in this kit. Um, this and this is one p orbital containing one electron in the whole thing. Sorry, get it on camera, that's better. So this is one p orbital, and this is the other p orbital. So if we had a mirror of this side by side, you will hopefully see. So for example, they've done one of the p's in red and the other p in green. And we're getting an end on overlap. So there certainly is a sigma bond there. There's another sigma bond here. Sorry. And of course, another sigma bond here. And one pi bond from this orbital in red and the other pi bond at 90 degrees to it in green. A few years back, uh, somebody did build me a balloon model of this. It's quite funky. Feel free to go and try it yourself. So that is actually the true structure of that molecule. We write it that way, but as you can see, perhaps we should write it. <laughs> if we keep the colour code, sigma here is orange. So all the bonds in orange are sigma. All the bonds in blue are one of the p orbitals and he says running out of colors let's go with uh black no let's go with brown slightly different easier to see so that so for example in this color coding here this represents a pi bond um this also represents a pi bond just a different p orbital and of course orange represents a sigma bond so in the case of alkyne, there sorry, in case of ethyne, there are one, two, three sigma bonds and two pi's. In the case of ethene, have I lost my ethene? In the case of ethene, yeah, let's do the color code correctly. Yeah, let's redraw ethene like we should draw it. And 
there should be, so there are one, two, three, four, five sigmas and only one pi. And of course, um, in the case of ethene, ethene, sorry, that's what I get for thinking ahead. I do sincerely apologize. They're all sigmas. So all six bonds in ethene are sigma bonds using our color code. Right. Where do I want to go next? What was my, what were my original intentions? I wanted to talk about atomic orbitals. Uh, I wanted to just remind you about the, the nature of a covalent bond. We don't talk about it that much. It's sharing a pair of electrons between two half-filled orbitals. Now we realize they can share in a variety of ways. Um, we talked about why this doesn't work for atomic orbitals. So therefore the atomic orbitals have to end up combining and we looked at the fact that there are three different ways to combine the atomic orbitals. You can combine all three of the P's with the S and you make SP3s. Or you can start picking off individual P's and they can stay by themselves as P orbitals. And you create fewer hybrids and more standalone P orbitals. We also looked at how these orbitals overlap with each other. When you get end on overlap like that, we call that a sigma bond. When you get sideways overlap between unhybridized p orbitals, we call these pi bonds. So yeah, that is massively simplified, as you can see. And lastly, I want to talk about color. Where was I? Oh yeah, color. I've been buying, I've been buying cheap permanent markers from Littles here. Now, let's talk about pigments. Before we talk about pigments, we have to mention something called bonding and antibonding orbitals. This is a tricky topic, to say the least. And do you know what? Professor Dave, who I'll try and link down by the doobly-doo, he probably does a much better job of explaining what true nature of unbonding and antibonding orbitals are than I can. But the SQA use the A word, the antibonding word, so they're expecting you to be aware that they exist. Let me try and explain very briefly what they are. We learned that electrons can behave as particles and waves a long time ago, back in one of my first uh, quantum mechanics videos. Now, when they behave like waves, that means they can have a polarity. You know, there is a wave which has two maxima, one here and one here, but the polarity of these maxima are opposite to each other. We could call, for example, one positive and one negative. Now, this this is I'm going to, I'm not going to go far into this because it's beyond my area in some ways as well. I've forgotten loads of stuff that I learned about this from university a long time ago. Um, but basically, when you have orbitals, they you can have what's called a bonding orbital, which is effectively constructive interference, and you can have an anti-bonding orbital which is destructive interference and does not cause covalent bonds. The best way to look at this, I think, would probably be to see if I could construct a model of it. So if you imagine, let's go with helium for, uh, that, let's not go with helium, sorry, jumping thing on. Let's go with 1s orbitals. So 1s orbitals have the possibility of overlapping in a construct, but if you behave them as waves, the waves could be in sync with each other, like that, or they could be uh, out of synchronization with each other, like that. And if they're in synchronization with each other, that promotes the formation of covalent bonds and it is at a lower energy level. So we can draw, like, here's a 1s orbital, here's a 1s orbital. These are atomic orbitals, and when they combine together to form a molecular orbital, the famous diagram looks something like this. You have a bonding orbital here, and you have an anti-bonding orbital here. It's quite nice because it sort of explains why helium molecules, HE2, can't exist. You'll see why in a second. So this is a bonding orbital, which is a lower energy. And this is the anti-bonding orbital for when these two 1s's overlap. In other words, their waves are out of synchronization with each other. And here is what happens when they do overlap in a constructive way. So this represents this situation here, and this represents this situation here. Now for hydrogen, 
both uh, of these atoms contribute one electron, of course, and I said earlier on that a covalent bond is a shared pair of electrons in an orbital. Boom. So H2. If you tried to make He2, you could have four electrons now, and you'd have to do one, two, three, and four. So this wants to form a covalent bond, but this orbital here destroys the covalent bond, so that's basically one of the reasons you don't get helium-2. But I'm not going to go any further into that, um, because it is really complex. I'm going to leave antibonding orbitals there. What I'm going to do is go back to the SQA and see what on earth that's got to do with colour. Excuse me a second. Now, the SQA want you to be aware of a couple of terms here. The first one is chromophore, which uh, is the part of the molecule that causes it to have colour. I will come back to how that happens at the end of this, don't worry. I just want you to see this word. Ironically, I've written chromophore in black and white. Ha! Um, so chromophore is the part of the molecule that will cause this molecule to have a colour. Now, how on earth would you spot this? And the answer is relatively straightforward, believe it or not. Um, what you need is an alternating single and double bond pattern. And that part of the molecule is the chromophore. I did see a couple of words. I want to throw a second word at you, which is a word in chemistry describing when you have alternating doubles and singles like that, which is conjugated. So a conjugated molecule has that. You can also get conjugation inside benzene rings. I mentioned that earlier on. So a benzene ring counts as a conjugated system because technically speaking, there's a few different ways to represent benzene. That, of course, is the accurate one. But some people still represent it as this. And then there are reasons why, because it's really handy in some cases. Um, happy benzene molecule. Um, just for carry. Uh, so we've got um, benzene can be represented as this, but as you can see, that's also alternating double and single bonds. So benzene is also a chromophore. It can cause colour to appear in molecules. Let me have a look at why this colour exists and how uh, the structure of the molecule will affect the colour that you see. Now, I talked there previously about bonding orbitals and antibonding orbitals. Um, I'm not sure the SQ is logic in this, but I'm just filling you in what they want you to know. So basically, when you have a complex molecule, what you get is all the molecular orbitals start sort of crowding together at one particular energy level. These are all bonding orbitals. Um, and they all mush into one. So you can have loads and loads of electrons. Don't worry about whether they're parallel or not. Let's just, just, in fact, you know what? Never mind that. Let's just have loads of electrons. Simplicity. Um, and you can get a variety of different levels of orbital. So remember I said that antibonding orbitals are a higher energy level. So this antibonding orbital exists. It just happens to be empty. There are no electrons or fewer electrons in it than this one. We call this the highest energy this is the highest occupied molecular orbital. Highest in energy, of course, that's what's going up here. So this is energy. And this is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. There are no electrons in it. Now, the SQ have chosen to use these two uh, acronyms for the highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Highest occupied molecular orbital, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And what the SQAs say is, and they're right in this case, uh, is that incoming light, so if we were to fire ourselves, if there was a photon of light incoming, um, it might hit one of these electrons and promote it from the highest occupied molecular orbital up to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So that electron gets promoted up there, and of course the energy that's in this particular colour of light goes missing. Leaving you to see the complementary colour in the data book, in the, uh, the colour wheel in the data book. I can never remember what page that is. Let me just go and find it. Page 
page 20 in the data book is your color wheel guys and the last thing the SQA want you to know is that the length of the conjugated molecule the length of the chromophore actually sorry the length of the chromophore in your molecule affects the energy gap here and the longer the chromophore is the smaller this energy gap becomes so if you had a molecule like benzene for example benzene uh, going back to benzene just to keep it happy eh? so benzene has a conjugated system let's draw it I know it's not double bonds but let's draw it as if it was there's just six carbon atoms in a conjugated system um, that is a very short chromophore therefore the energy gap will be massive it will absorb light but it's absorbing in the ultraviolet region which we can't see um, so in order to get a colored molecule what you need to do is start elongating your chromophore just have a longer conjugated system and you'll get this energy gap down to the point where it's absorbing blue light which is the highest energy light of course and if it's absorbing blue light according to the SQA's color wheel reality by the way a little bit more complex but let's stick with what the SQA want you to know so um, where's my color wheel page 20 so if we oh, there we go so if we absorb in fact let's go with violet actually as the highest energy um, no they say purple in fact purple is the highest energy they're quoting purple as between being 380 and 400 nanometers so if the purple is absorbed then you will see green if we made this conjugated system even longer don't worry about the angles uh, let's fire a few more double alternating double and single bonds on my conjugated molecule here we will start the energy gap starts to come down even more we could perhaps absorb green light for this one and if we absorb uh, say bluey green light we would see this as a red molecule uh, and I'm hoping you'll see um, I'm hoping you'll see the connection therefore so basically the shorter uh, the conjugated system the more uh, the, the the smaller this energy gap becomes and we can start to absorb photons of visible light and whatever photons go missing you see the complementary color on the color wheel on page 20. right wasn't convinced that it's good enough job in that last uh, section so just a very brief recap and one shot here so this is our shorter conjugated system Sorry, interrupted by the phone there. I, I don't think it did a very good job. So here is hopefully the whole thing on one sheet. Here's our conjugated system of different lengths. Here's a shorter conjugated system. That corresponds to a higher energy gap for the electrons to be promoted out of the occupied molecular orbitals. Those are the bonding ones. Into the unoccupied molecular orbitals, the anti-bonding ones. When you have a longer conjugated system, you have a smaller energy gap. And what we've got is two different situations for which color is being absorbed and therefore the one that you see. So for example, if we have a higher energy gap, we may absorb a blue light. Can I find a blue pen? Yes, I can. So if that absorbs blue on our SQA sheet, you would see yellow. Although again, you know, in reality, it's a bit more complex than that. I don't even, ironically, I don't know if you can see that yellow. Ha! Now, when you have a longer energy gap, um, you have a, sorry, a longer conjugated system, you have a smaller energy gap, that may well absorb something like, for example, um, greeny blue. Do we have a greeny blue? This is close enough. And I'm saying greeny blue because it's one of the thing, oh, green, I've forgotten how to spell. Uh, it's one of the colors that's mentioned on your actual SQA chart. They might, of course, give you a, a wavelength like 495 nanometers, for example. So you find 495 nanometers, find what's opposite it, and the answer to that is red. That would be what you would actually see. Right. Sorry for the epic video, guys, but there's quite a few complicated things in this. What on earth can the SQA actually ask you? There's... This is a favourite for the open-ended question, isn't it? Because you can draw diagrams, you can write stuff, it's great for open-enders. Um, the other thing I have seen them is, and I've done it through this video automatically, is uh, they'll ask you to count the number of sigma and pi bonds that are in um, different systems. And the very last thing that I've seen them ask you is to explain the nature 
of say a sigma bond versus a pi bond as in one is end on overlap one is um, sideways overlap diagrams probably help you in terms of explanations there but thank you for listening to this epic ramble folks hopefully it's been of some help bye bye